we'll let the last few people trickle in here. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Welcome to day three of Social Media Week, and welcome to the Politics, Government, and Health and Wellness, uh, one of our eight key venues. Uh, I'm Josh Hammond with Zocalo Group, and on behalf of Zocalo Group and uh, Digital 435, the two city host sponsors, welcome. Um, so in addition to this event, we have 185 events this year, and I hope you have time to register for more than just one. Uh, go to socialmediaweek.org slash Chicago, uh, and you'll see our full schedule and register for as many as you're able to attend. Uh, and then also, I'm sure many of you will want to tweet and do whatever while you're here. Uh, let me give you quickly the, the, the Wi-Fi information so you're able to log on. So we have two Wi-Fi names, uh, Summit underscore Cassidy or Summit hyphen Cassidy. And the password is Summit 2013, all one word, all lowercase. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, I'm going to give it over to our friends from Wilma, Suzanne Fanning. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another fabulous day of Social Media Week Chicago. Uh, my name is Suzanne Fanning, and I am proud to say that I do serve on the Social Media Week Advisory Board. I am also proud to serve as the president of the Word of Mouth Marketing Association, known to our friends as WOMA. We are the official nonprofit trade association for the social media and word of mouth marketing industries. If you love what's going on at Social, Week, social Media Week, if you love the inspiration, the education, the networking, you might want to check out everything that we have going on at WOMA.org. Okay, I'm not here to actually talk about WOMA today. I am here to introduce Brandon Mendelson. Um, he has written this little book that some of you may have heard of. It's actually quite controversial. Some people read it and really, really agree with the contents. Some people read it and get really, really upset with the contents. I have actually seen people come to very, very loud and active debates over the topics in this book. But whether you agree with it or whether you disagree, whether you like it, whether you hate it, what I do guarantee is that you will be talking about it after you leave this session. Now, if you know the title of this book, I'd like for you to help me out right now. The title is, Social Media is? Bullshit. I am appalled at the language in this room, I have to say, ladies and gentlemen. But this is a guarantee that I can make you, too. Once our friend BJ comes to the stage, the language is actually going to get quite a bit worse. So be, be prepared for that. Um, keep in mind that in addition to being an acclaimed author, he is also a comedian. He does stand-up comedy, and he is the mastermind behind some really, really brilliant viral comedy that we've seen uh, online over the years, including the universal breakup card that I'm sure many of you have heard about. What you probably do not know about this man, however, is that he has a really, really huge heart, and he will go to the ends of the earth and back again for the charities and for the causes that he believes in. And for that reason, he has really made a significant impact for those charities and causes. So, all right, I'm going to bring the main event out here right now, ladies and gentlemen, pre pre presenting, not preventing, presenting B.J. Mendelson. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. I don't usually have notes with me, but I just had massive heart surgery. Uh, so I'm a little, my short-term memory is fried, so if you see me looking at this, don't be offended. It's a, it's a first for me, but we'll get through it. Now, people are assholes. If you take anything away from this presentation, if you tweet something using the hashtag, let it be that. That's really the theme of this, because social media when we talk about the platforms, they can be awesome. The problem is, is that we're assholes and we uh, do what assholes do and fuck things up. And sometimes it doesn't work the way that we hope it does. Sometimes, that's not always the case though. How many of you have been following the story with Miss America? You aware of it? Okay, a few of you. A uh, short version is a beautiful, talented woman, one Miss America, she's Indian American, she's from Syracuse, New York. And on Twitter, a few, uh, let's call them shitheads, <laughs> decided that they were going to be really racist about it and go after her about her heritage, about how the way she looked. If you listen to the stories in the media, 
you would think that there was thousands and thousands of people that were attacking her. And that was all at Twitter that was attacking this beautiful and smart woman. But it's not. And that takes me to the first point. What you hear in the news, what you hear from guys like Gary Vaynerchuk and my friend Dave Kirpin and Guy Kawasaki and Chris Brogan, and I can go on and on, but you already know those names. It's not really the full picture. And so my goal in doing these presentations isn't to be an asshole. It's actually to, and I gag a little in my mouth when I say, or to, say this, inspire you. And I gag a little because so many social media marketers have taken to that. I want to inspire love and change and kindness, and they, they don't really mean it. <laughs> but I do. Because I don't want to be an asshole. I want to be a good guy. The 1% rule. Stop me if you heard this. The 1% rule is a fancy way of referring to participation inequality. Basically, that's a big word. I don't know why I'm using it that early in, this, in the morning. Basically, what you see on Twitter, what you see on Facebook, what you see on LinkedIn, it doesn't matter the platform. It's true across every single platform. It's true going all the way back to 1997. The minority does the majority of the talking on these platforms. Miss America is a perfect example of that. You had all these fringe elements that were making a lot of noise, and the media doesn't do any fact checking. They don't do any critical thinking when it comes to social media. They just spit out stories. They just want page views and controversy. BuzzFeed was the one that originally said, hey, look at all these racist people on Twitter. What they didn't say was, these racist people do not reflect the majority of users on Twitter. In fact, it's less than a percent. This is something you have to think about when you use these platforms. It could be, if you're a large company, that that 1% is worth pursuing. Now, I was on a panel at uh, South by Southwest. I, I hated South by Southwest. I don't know how many people actually go to that. Don't. Uh, it's really an excuse for people to get shit-faced and then talk about social media and technology. And, and again, nothing gets done. But I was on this panel with this guy from Adobe. And I, I talked about participation inequality. And he says to me, huh. I want that 1%. Shit, why not? I got the budget. Let's do it. Well, if you've got the budget of Adobe, knock yourself out. But I imagine most of you in this room, you can raise your hand if you want, probably don't have a budget like that. And so you have to think, when you start doing these campaigns, when we talk about actually measuring the real return on investment, is that 1% worth pursuing? And if not, we have to start to reconsider why we use these platforms and what we're actually getting out of them. Again, that doesn't mean the platforms are bad. People walk away from this presentation saying, Brandon said don't use YouTube, I'm not going to use YouTube, and fuck anyone who says use YouTube. Not saying that. What I am saying is you have to think about it and do a little more questioning than what usually goes into planning a social media campaign. A couple of fun facts, people don't realize this. Over 290 million Americans don't use Twitter. <laughs> it's true. I checked that five times before I got on stage. I was standing back, I go, no, that, that, that's right. 290 million Americans do not use Twitter. 187 million Americans possibly, sort of, kind of use Facebook. We don't really know, because if you ask Facebook, they don't tell you how they calculate monthly active users and daily active users. They kind of go, oh, well, you know, they, they logged in. Well, what does that mean? Did they log in through Dig? Did they actually go to Facebook.com? Did they access it on their phone? No, 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 They logged in. The fuck's that mean? <laughs> so you don't know. And that's not to say, again, I have to be careful. I don't want people to, like, to, to run away with the wrong impression. That doesn't mean don't use Facebook. That just means you, know, you always hear about a billion users. A billion, 1.1 billion users use Facebook. You always see that in the news. It's always a billion users on Facebook. They don't tell you that 8 out of 10 of those users are not American. So if you sell products in America, or if you are marketing to a certain geographic area, that's something to really think about. Same deal with YouTube. 70% of the views on YouTube come from outside of America. So it might be awesome if you're doing something and you want like, the world to see it, but it's not so awesome if you're a dealership in Tacoma, Washington, and you don't really care about you know, Washington State and maybe Oregon. By the way, Washington State is a terrible place. If any of you are from there, I'm really sorry. 
Also, the thing with the views is that they can be easily faked. A certain large corporation, I'm not going to name names, uh, you have their products in your bathroom. That's all I'll say. A certain large corporation purchased over 10 million YouTube views. You have seen this video. You have heard it referred to as a viral video. But what you don't know is that almost all of the views to start off were completely fake. There is a book that just came out. It's number one on the Amazon list. Do not buy it. Uh, it it's number one. Amazon's really easily games, by the way. That, that's actually not in my notes, but you should know how easy it is to trick Amazon. You know, I mentioned one, the gentleman who bulk purchased 10,000 copies of his book to be a New York Times bestseller. Uh, but this guy also manipulated the algorithm to be number one. And he did that using sock puppets. Do, how many of you know who's, what sock puppets are? OK, cool. This is good, because you know, I've been doing this for about a year now. And I'll say sock puppets, and they'll be like, you mean like Mr. Socko from McFoley? If you got that reference, I love you. <laughs> you need a hug from me. A friend of mine works for a certain large theater chain. It uh, has an I in the name. You can think about who that might be. And she's sitting down with her boss. And she goes, hey, um, you know, I, I'm a social media coordinator. I love what I do. I get to interact with people. It's a great job. I would really like to be able to measure sales through my efforts. I want to say to you, I did this on Twitter over the course of this month, and these are the sales that correlate to my activity on Twitter. The boss essentially says, fuck that shit. And she goes, well, uh, what do you want me to look at? And the boss goes, I want to have 40,000 Facebook fans by the end of this quarter. We have to deal with this. This is the world we live in. How many of you have heard or experienced something similar to that? I, I always find a lot of hands go up for that. And it's very frustrating because if you work in social media, if you work in marketing, look, the social media is a dumb term. It's like content marketing. It doesn't fucking mean anything. <laughs> or inbound marketing. Fuck HubSpot. I just want to say that. Fuck HubSpot. <laughs> Fuck them in the ass with a giant steel dildo that says Made in America on it. And I say that loving Dan Lyons. Uh, he's a good guy. He's the, actually the editor-in-chief of HubSpot. But now everyone, everyone's an inbound marketing specialist or a content marketing specialist. And you go, what does that even mean? Well, it's about creating good content and telling a good story and adding value. Does anyone really know what that means? You know it's true. It doesn't mean anything. So what's the future of this? I get asked this all the time. Please be careful when you read stories about social media. The journalists suck. They do no fact checking. They don't ask questions. They just mindlessly report numbers and statistics, which, by the way, this, is, this just happened in the New York Times. Nick Bilton, how many of you read Nick Bilton in the Bits blog? I have problems with Nick Bilton. Uh, and the reason why is very simple. He, for the past two years, has been advocating that you should be able to use electronic devices during takeoff and landing. That's been his big thing for about two years now. The other day, he came out with an article and said, hey, the FAA is finally doing something about it. And reports say that passengers want this. Do you know where those reports came from? About three months earlier, Nick built into the story using information from a lobbying group of the major technology manufacturers. Those were his sources. And those were his sources being portrayed as, this is what people want. And that might be what people want, but you have to look at what the information that he was using. So when you hear stories about social media, you really got to think about this. And so I get asked dumb fucking questions. And one of those questions is, where is it all going? And the truth is, it's going offline. How many of you have heard this statistic? 93%. 93 of word of mouth marketing occurs offline. 93. One hand up. I'm proud of that. Uh, thank you. It's uh, Dr. Jonah Berger. The book is called Contagious. It's highly recommended. That's where that statistic comes from. Great fucking book. Uh, my background is actually in viral marketing. We'll get to that in a second. But 
93%. I saw someone the other day that she was uh, using the hashtags, and there was a presenter, I guess, that said, email marketing is more effective than social media marketing, and she lost her shit. She was going after the presenter saying, fuck you, you don't know what you're talking about. And how many of you heard that, that email marketing is more effective? How many of you agree with that? One hand, up oh, two hands. Okay, kind of three, you're like, uh, uh, uh. It's not necessarily true. Everybody is different. So you wonder, where is it all going? Everybody is different. What works for you, won't work for you. What works for you, won't work for you. What works for you, won't work for you. All of your customers are different. Every platform is different. Every campaign is different. And so the problem has always been, you've got guys like Gary Vaynerchuk who come up here and tell you, what's the ROI of average, oh, I'm sorry, let me do my Gary. What's the ROI of advertising? What's the fucking ROI of your mother? That's a good Gary Vaynerchuk, right? That's, that's, I'm not sweating as much as he does. There is an ROI to advertising. We've always heard this shit, though, when it comes to social media. And so we don't think about that. We kind of have this weird context and where we're going, we need to get away from that. We need to think about this stuff. Maybe, and this is heresy, maybe the platform you need to use for your campaign is radio. Oh, radio's dead, fuck radio. Maybe instead of Facebook, it's the newspaper. Print has the highest rate of recall among all forms of advertisement. I'm not saying that's the case for you. What I'm saying is you need to start thinking about this. If you want to measure the true return on investment, this is the thought process that needs to occur. I have this stupid acronym. I have two stupid acronyms that I'm going to give you. First one, I feel so lame doing this. But again, I'm using notes, so it's A-B-G-D. I wish it was something badass, like always be closing. Fuck you, coffee's for closers. It's not. That's a great movie. If you work in the industry that we work in, you must know that film, Glengarry Glen Rose. You have to see that. That's required viewing for this industry. A, B, G, D. A lot of this stuff will sound like common sense. That's good because it fucking is. A, B, G, D. Always be gathering data. Constantly. Now, that doesn't mean get crazy and be like a lot of our friends over at 1871 or at Catapult and a lot of those fine incubators, I know them well. Uh, you don't need to be as hardcore as them when it comes to analytics and measuring data, but you should always be gathering information. And again, this is common sense shit, but it's never been said on stage. The social media marketers come on here and they tell you, well, I have a New York Times bestseller even though I cheated the list, and you gotta be likable, and that like being likable is gonna drive sales. No, it's fucking not. What's going to drive sales is getting as much fucking information as you can about your target customer. It's marketing 101. Please, please, please go and buy Kellogg on Marketing if you don't have it already. It's the Northwestern University book. They have a damn fine marketing program. It's one of the best MBA programs in the country. Their marketing book should be your Bible. And almost on the first fucking page, they say, always be gathering data. Know who your customers are. We have never talked about that as an industry, though. We've always been like, oh, well, social media is the great equalizer and everyone will see everything that we publish. Bullshit. It's 100% not true. A, B, G, D, always be gathering data. I like to use funnels. Uh, my experience as a viral marketer, I'll give you two examples. How many of you remember the, the big YouTube CNN presidential debate from 2007? Nobody. Okay, too. I feel really old right now. I just turned 30, so thanks for that. Assholes. During the run-up to the debate, I did a short video of my cat, Molly. And it was, this was back when all the pet, you remember when the pet food was tainted? And people were really scared about feeding their pets? So I did a short video of Molly saying, how are you going to protect my food, bitches? Uh, it didn't really say bitches. This is a presidential debate, after all. Uh, and I uploaded it to the, to the queue that, that they had there. The video was everywhere. It was on the San Jose Mercury News. It was on the front page of Wonka. It was on Gawker. Everywhere. My experience is being able to spread ideas. 
I knew it was the right time and the right message and the right vehicle and the right platform. And those are things you need to follow. Right message, right time, right vehicle, right platform, constantly. I'll tell you how to do that, so don't worry. The other success I had with viral marketing is, uh, it's near and dear to my heart. It's an organization called Wounded Warriors Family Support. It is not Wounded Warrior Project. It is not. They do not get along, so I have to clarify that. Uh, Wounded Warrior Project is like the big, you know, the big burly guy on the beach that kicks sand at everyone, and you know, they're, they're, everyone knows who they are because of how big they are. Uh, I like to, pr I prefer to support the smaller military not for profits that people don't really know about because they're more hands-on with the soldiers and their families. It's, it's something I really care about. If you read this book, by the way, if you don't have a copy of the book, take out your phone, call me, text me, 518, I'll give it again, don't worry, 518-832-9844. I will send you a free electronic copy of the book. At the end of the book, I talk about this breast cancer tour, which absolutely destroyed my marriage. Absolutely. Like, if I look back at, uh, at what ruined it, it was, it was that tour. And when I came back, I said, this can't all be for nothing. Sounds a lot like Walter White, actually. It can't be all for nothing. This is, I've totally destroyed this relationship. I have to fix it. And randomly, this uh, man calls me. His name's Colonel John Folsom. And he says, you know, I heard about this breast cancer tour. Because he got a lot of media coverage. A lot of people don't realize that. I mean, it was all over the fucking place. I heard about this tour, and I work with wounded soldiers that come back, and the whole thing is that they're trying to reconnect with their family. It's very, very difficult. A lot of people don't realize that. It, that is probably the toughest thing a soldier has to do when they come back from war, and they're hurt, or they're missing a limb, or they're just not going to operate the way that they used to. Reconnecting with a family is the fucking hardest part. What I do is I take those families and bring them to Disney World, I bring them to Orlando Studios, and it's, it's not a vacation, but what it is is it's an experience that they can have where there's no pressure, that there's no fear of what the future might hold. It's just this nice moment. And I want to be able to bring that across the country and let people know about it. So the problem with the breast cancer tour was that I relied too much on social media. I was a true believer. I believed everything Gary Vaynerchuk said, everything Scott Monty said, fuck Scott Monty. The Ford Fiesta movement, his big thing that he always talks about was a total failure. People at Ford will tell you that. I believed everything they said. I was a true believer. So I built this whole tour around the beliefs that were peddled by these guys. And it was a massive failure. And so I took a step back and said, okay, you know, the colonel wants to do something similar. How can I fix this? And I went back to viral marketing because it works. It fucking works. And so the trick to viral marketing, it's, it's all about having a system in place. You want to measure the return on investment, it's all about having a system. You get that system locked in place with all the data that you're gathering, you will be able to see actual results and go to your boss and say, fuck yeah, that worked. And so we did. We did this tour, multi-million dollar success. It's in its fourth year. It's highfivetour.com for those of you with uh, web access. In viral marketing, here's the other acronym that I really fucking hate. It's A-A-R-R. -R. Or if you're really into pirates, R. It's so lame. I know why I just did that. I'm going to feel really bad about myself for the rest of the day for that. <laughs> stupid. So stupid. I'll be sitting on the plane flying back. I'll be sitting next to the guy going, stupid. A-A-R-R. -R. That's acquisition, activation, retention, referral. Acquisition, activation, retention, referral. You do this every day. You've just not put it in the right context. Acquisition, activation, retention, referral. That's the basics of viral marketing. So how do you do that? How do you set up that funnel with all this information that you're gathering? Well, let's start there. How many of you do focus groups? A few, OK, that's really good. How many of you do surveys? Good. I've done a lot of presentations where people are like, what, sir, what? How many of you do the beer test? Ah, OK, this one hasn't caught on yet. This one's really big in uh, San Francisco. By the way, cheap plug, I am the new editor of socialtimes.com. My job is to make it more realistic in terms of what social media can and can do for people. Cheap plug. Uh, in San Francisco, this guy figured out, I'm going to get an iPad. I'm going to go to the bar. 
I'm going to hang out and I'm going to buy a drink for someone within my target demographic and maybe buy them another one, but not too many. And I'm going to say, hey, you know, I'd love if you checked something out for me and just told me what you think. And so he would take out the iPad and be like, hey, can you, can you do this? Can you like, click on this and order a book? And what he found was that people were really terrible at using his website. Now, you might be thinking, what does alcohol have to do with, with testing, testing the data that you're gathering? Everything. Because on the web, we are totally distracted. We are using like less than 5% of our brain at any given moment. You know, this porn BuzzFeed, porn BuzzFeed. Uh, maybe your RSS reader, if you still use that, I still do. So we, we constantly are divided in terms of our attention. And so he figured out, if I get people drunk, it's almost like the equivalent of the experience of them using my website online. It works. He went back, he took the data, he tweaked his website, and off he went. So when we talk about you know, AARR, we talk about this gathering information, you have to think this way. You have to constantly be getting out of the office and talking to your people. If you think that women 25 to 34, your prime demographic, college educated, high income, then you need to go out and meet those people. The biggest part of the social media job that we never talk about is actually getting out of the fucking office. You have to know who you're talking to because of the 1% rule. With the 1% rule, you really don't know if that person represents your target audience or not. You've got to get out of the office. That is key, but it's almost never talked about. So there's a couple of things that really bother me about this industry and about this business. I'm going to give you two concrete examples as to how to actually measure ROI. And at that point, we can, we can do a Q&A thing. We can talk. Or I could just sit here and continue bullshitting. Now, when you set up the funnel, when you start gathering this data, at the end of the funnel, you kind of have to know what the goal is. So sometimes you get a boss that says, I want 40,000 Facebook fans. Well, how do you actually report to your boss that you've been successful beyond having that? He's got a boss in front of him, and he's got a boss in front of him, and she's probably the boss at the top. So he might want 40,000 Facebook fans, but the people above him might be going, where the fuck's my money going? So let me give you a good example. Let's say you operate, a, well, you all operate websites, but let's say the website is the primary vehicle of your business. You're driving people to the website. You have an ebook you want to sell. You have a product that you want to sell on the website. What are your main metrics of success? Don't say page views. Say page views, I'm going to be pissed. The primary metrics you want to measure are clicks, obviously. Bounce rate. How many of you follow the bounce rate? OK, good. This is good. This is improvement. When I was doing this a year ago, fucking nobody. <laughs> page views don't count. Bounce rate, click throughs, time spent on site. Let's say those, you've agreed that those are your metrics. You start doing your testing. You start doing surveys. You start doing focus groups. You start doing the beer test. And then you look at the data and go, OK, well, you know, if I change this button from blue to red, that increased clicks by 300%. That's a true statistic, by the way. I don't know how many people know that. But just by changing the color on a call to action, people will click on it. There will be an increased click through. The color, though, depends on your audience, which goes back to always be gathering data. Now. You're driving people to this website. How do I know that they came from Twitter? And how do I know that they've actually converted? Again, this will sound really fucking obvious, but a lot of people don't do it. I was just talking to a bunch of car dealerships. They don't fucking do this. That's a problem. Twitter is the front of the funnel. Facebook is the front of the funnel. The end of the funnel is the actual sale, or whatever it is, the metric that you want to use. You have to think of it like that. Twitter can't be front and center. It has to be the front. And you're following them all the way down the funnel, bringing them to your website, looking at the metrics, looking at the click-through, going down the funnel. You can do an affiliate code. You can give them a bit.ly link. You can ask them. A lot of people don't think to do this. Again, it sounds really obvious. But ask them, what brought you here today? What made you click this? What brought about this purchase? Nobody asks these questions. When we do the surveys, we do it at the very start, but we don't do it at the end. 
you should always be asking questions. You should constantly be saying, why? Why does this work? What did you like about Twitter? That's at the end of the funnel. So for example, if we want, I want to give you something concrete that you can act on. So like, for example, if you have a website that's based around pro wrestling, which by the way, they do tremendous page views, which don't really matter, but to advertisers they do. You always hear this vague bullshit about telling a good story, creating good content. What the fuck does that mean? How many of you have seen Die Hard? That's a great fucking story, isn't it? Use Die Hard as an example. Watch that movie over and over and over again. Every screenwriting book that you read, anything that's about telling stories in Hollywood uses Die Hard as an example. Die Hard is a great, easy to understand story with a clear cut villain, a clear cut hero with a clear goal. It's very easy to follow. So when you hear shit like, well, you gotta create good content. No, you gotta be like Die Hard. Totally different, right? I hope. You gotta use that as, a, as an example to draw people in. So let's say you've got this wrestling website, you're like, okay, my demographic is male. Eh, it's 17 to like 25, they're not college educated, they, you know, they're really into MMA. How do I pull them in? Research fucking everything. Everything. If you don't know what your customers listen to and watch at night and read and do in their car, you're doing it wrong. Go and fix that. You need to know everything about the customer. And then you go, okay, I've got this wrestling website. I know that they listen to MMA talk radio on Sears uh, or XM, whatever it's called these days. I don't have it. I'm going to craft content just like that. I'm going to mirror my content off of stuff they already like. This is okay. This is not copying. This is not plagiarism. Stealing shit from Reddit is a little more like plagiarism. Copy the stuff that they already like and then start to tweak it based on the data that you're pulling in. That's your content. That's how you create content that people are going to actually follow. You don't hear that shit from these people. You do that, you tweak the data, you pull people through your funnel, and at the end you say, what brought you here? More often than not, you will hear it was the good content because it was something like what I liked already. Sounds obvious. Let me give you one more example. If you do something, how many of you sell product offline or have a store offline and work for someone who's got like an offline presence? Okay, this is important. I was in Burlington, Vermont, and I did my presentation, and this woman comes up to me at the end. She's crying. And I was picking on this guy with, with a Detroit Tigers hat. I thought for sure it was his wife. It wasn't. Uh, which, by the way, fucked the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> I know in Chicago that joke would play really well. That's called pandering to the audience. She's crying. And she says to me, you know, I've got this offline store. I've spent so much on social media. I haven't done any other kind of advertising because I keep hearing this is the thing. It's a true story. I said, well, why didn't you stop? I spent all this money on it. And she says to me, I didn't want to look stupid. You're all familiar with this. You all know someone who, who has silently said, maybe quietly in a conversation after a meeting, you know, this stuff is bullshit. It doesn't work. Or it doesn't work the way that we think it does. You all know a woman like this. And so I said to her, you know what, you're right. It could be that social media is not the right platform for what you do. Again, always be gathering data. Always be gathering data. And so I said to her, you know what, here's a good example. This is what we're going to do. You've already spent money on acquiring users, which by the way, the only thing, and I'm going to repeat this twice, the only thing you should ever spend money on in social media, the only thing is acquiring the first thousand users. After that, don't fucking spend any money. Just don't. I know it's hard to turn off the spigot once it's going. Thousand users, stop. Because once you've got that thousand, you can start pulling them through the funnel. You can start gathering the data, and you will see, I promise you, if you do it right, they will start referring people, which is the end of the R acronym. They will start referring people to you. Once you pass that first thousand, stop spending money. Facebook ads, by the way, ooh, that wasn't good. Facebook ads, by the way, you can see I'm used to wearing lapel mics. Work if you spend a lot of money on them. It's true. The catch 
is that Facebook is the world's ugliest slot machine. Maybe it pays out, maybe it doesn't, but you gotta keep putting money in. I love Wheel of Fortune in Vegas. It's my favorite game. Wheel of Fortune punishes you. Sure, it might pay out 100 bucks, but if you stay at it long enough, you're gonna lose 300. A certain multi-billion dollar company, her social media manager had said to me, I don't see a return on Facebook. I do see a return on Google. How many of you experienced that? I see a couple hands going up. Again, everyone's different. You have to think about it. So I said to her, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go, we're gonna get you the first thousand fans. Then we're gonna start asking them questions. And we're gonna say, hey, come to the store and just let's do, a, let's do an informal focus group. Focus groups, by the way, don't have to be expensive. I always get this. When I say do a focus group, people go, oh, I gotta fucking hire a consultant and I gotta film shit. No, just buy pizza. <laughs> go on the Craigslist, put an ad somewhere. Again, you have to know where your customers are. You have to know what they're reading and looking at. Go to Craigslist and say, hey, do you, do you like MMA? If so, I don't like MMA, by the way. Just so you know, like I'm not plugging it but I'm just using it as an example. If you like it, hey, come to the store. We've got some products that you can use you know, every Saturday night when you watch the big fight. I'd love to hear what you think. Free pizza, free beer, whatever. That's a focus group. You don't have to spend the money on all this other bullshit. Just bring the customer offline. Where is it all going? Offline. 93% of word of mouth marketing happens offline. Acquire the users, bring them through your funnel by pulling them offline. She saw sales increase. All she had to do was talk to her customers and start asking them questions. It sounds really obvious. I know sometimes people go, oh, no, that's fucking common sense. Common sense isn't so common. And so you have to think about this stuff. And when in doubt, steal from Reddit. It works really well. Okay. I know we started a little late. I moved a little quickly through the presentation because I wanted to answer questions. This is the most important part of this presentation. You are here in a nearly packed house at nine o'clock in the morning to hear why this stuff is bullshit, why this stuff doesn't work. I already have a question. Don't hesitate to ask. This is your time. The key to this is being able to walk away with something valuable for you. Okay, so I. Thank you. Um, my question refers to the last page. It says you only need the first thousand in Pakistan. Then bring them offline. So my question is, if the final purchase and advocacy or loyalty building happens in a digital world, meaning that the company or the client or the customer makes the purchase online, how do you bring them back? You have them online through social media, then you have them offline talking among their friends, then you want to bring them back to the digital world. How do you do that? You want to pull them back online? I just want to make sure I understand the question. Once you've gathered that information, once you start shaping content like Die Hard, if people like it, they will come back. If people like it. That's always a catch. It's a vague, shitty statement that you always hear. So let me break it down a little bit. How do you know if someone likes it? You look at the metrics. How do you know if someone likes it? You ask them questions. You always have to be talking to them. And I don't mean on Twitter. I mean getting their phone number. If you have like a big Twitter following, by the way, if you have a big following on Twitter and Facebook or LinkedIn, you might notice that you can't pull the data into something you can use offline. You, know, you, can't, you don't have their emails. Facebook does not give you their email address. Get that information. That's how you do it. If you have that big following, you say to them, hey, what's your number? Give them a call. Hey, what's your address? Send them a care package. People respond to this. I promise you they will respond to it. And the reason why I know is that there's been multi-million dollar companies. There's one right here in Chicago called Genuine Scooters. That's how they built their revenue, was by pulling in people and saying, hey, let me talk to you for about five, 10 minutes. What do you think about this? That's important. If you do that, if you, and engagement is a shitty word that's been absolutely ruined, but I'm gonna use it just this one time. If you engage with your customers, like a human, that's key, you will see results. And when I say like a human, I got like a direct message minutes before coming on stage from Louis Anderson. I've never talked to Louis Anderson. I kind of vaguely know who he is. 
and it's like, hey, check out my new campaign, here's the stupid hashtag. That's not being a human. Being a human is saying, hey, you know what? What's your number? I just want to have like maybe a five minute conversation. I'm not going to sell you anything. I'm not going to push anything on you. I just want to talk. Most people will respond to that. It sounds crazy, but most people will respond to that. And if you do that right, they will come back online and they'll tell their friends. Morning. Hello. Um, could you give an example of uh, a campaign executed by a large company using social media that you liked and thought was effective? Oh, there's a few of them, actually. Domino's. Do you remember the, uh, the disgusting incident with Domino's where someone like farted on pizza and then they filmed themselves doing it? Fucking stupid. Um, what, what are you going to do? You have so many employees, you can't, you can't control them. Domino's did a great job, and Crispin Porter, by extension, uh, did a great job with them, where they were kind of like, okay, we fucked up. You know, nothing is more sacred than food, which is why you can actually get information from customers by buying them pizza or buying them beer. Nothing is more sacred than food in America. We fucking love food. And Chicago's a good place to eat food, by the way. They knew that they had fucked up. Their customer will not trust them now. Even if it does not happen in a thousand branches, it just had to happen in one. So Domino's came out with a YouTube video with the CEO. It wasn't perfect, but it was good enough. And he kind of, he kind of said, you know, we messed up. I'm going to tell you how to fix it, or how we're going to fix it, and I'm going to document the whole process of doing it. So they did the YouTube video, they did the press release, they did the news campaigns, then they documented the progress and they kept people posted about it. And they kept saying, we're fixing it, we're fixing it, we're fixing it. And then at the end, if you look on all of your Domino's boxes, they have a phone number on there saying, call us. Again, taking it offline, get the phone number, get the email, call us and tell us how we're doing. That was a great use of social media because the problem with social media, how it's always been portrayed by the Vaynerchucks and the Kirpins and the Montes and all those assholes, is that it's like this magical, mystical thing and we lose the human element of it. And Domino's got that. If you work in social media, it's all about being a human and not being shitty. And Domino said, you know what? We fucked up. We're going to fix it. And I thought that was a great campaign. The other one is the one I mentioned where they bought 10 million uh, YouTube views. Uh, YouTube is very easily gamed. So is Amazon, by the way. If any of you work uh, with putting stuff on YouTube, it is very easily manipulated. I'll tell you how, because I don't really care. I got nothing to lose by telling it. You want to manipulate YouTube, what you do, if you, if you want to be a shitty person, is to go on there and have at least 100 people watch the video from start to finish within the first 10 minutes that it goes online. That triggers the algorithm. Then you want a lot of people to share it through Facebook. The other shit doesn't really matter, but if you share it through Facebook, Google system goes, okay, yeah, this could be popular, and it starts surfacing higher, and you start driving attention to it using traditional PR, which, by the way, train yourself in traditional PR. If you, don't know, if you don't know who Edward Bernays is, go and read his books. It's very important to know PR in social media. Then they did all the PR campaign, they drove traffic to you, then started surfacing higher and higher and higher, and then finally people were like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool because other people said it's cool. That's key. That is key on anything that you do online. Nobody wants to go to an empty bar, but they will go to a bar that already looks popular even if it actually isn't. That goes to buying your first thousand users or driving fake traffic. I thought that was a good campaign. It worked really well. They actually saw an increase in sales. I wish I could tell you who it was, but they would be furious. And uh, you don't want to piss off a multi-billion dollar global conglomerate. I might not survive the next heart surgery if I do. Other questions? Yeah, I'd like to challenge you a little bit on sure. that 1% Twitter issue. Sure. You know, if 10% of that 1% are Guy Kawasaki's or Seth Godin's or B.G. Mendelssohn's of the world. Oh, bad company. Bad <laughs> company. You know, they each have their own channel, so it's really magnified as most people listen as opposed to speak. So it seems it's more power there than, than you suggest. Here's the issue. How many of you actually look through your entire Twitter timeline? Let's see a few hands. How many of you actually look through all of your Facebook posts that you see in your newsfeed? 
The problem with building, you're basically saying they build a platform and that voice carries and so it helps magnify their, right, so I understand it. The issue with social media, especially now with the algorithms on Twitter, is you might not necessarily see everything. Does that mean don't do it? No. I think if it works based on always be gathering data, then it should be part of the plan. Don't rely on it. That's the key difference with what I talk about versus what they talk about. They have always been, this is the great equalizer. Everyone has a voice. That's not necessarily the case. If you're a Seth Godin or a Guy Kawasaki or Gary Vaynerchuk, by the way, quick story about Gary Vaynerchuk. He was already a multimillionaire before he started doing the other stuff. A lot of people think social media led to his success. It's not actually the case. In fact, Folks like him like to say, what's the ROI of advertising? What's the ROI of your mother? I can't actually measure it. But he actually grew his business by his own admission in the opening pages of Crush It through traditional advertising. That's a big social media guru who everyone knows about who gets on stage and says advertising doesn't work in the front pages of his book saying advertising works. So the channels are always going to be a little different. For him, clearly, he's pushing an agenda. Guy Kawasaki, it might work on Twitter. He might have gone through the demographic information and said, you know what? By the way, New York City, you should have a Twitter account. San Francisco, you should have a Twitter account. That much is true. Everybody is different. And it's a mistake to tell people everything works the way that we're portraying it. My whole thing is gather information and decide for yourself. I hope that kind of answers it. I know that. Just remember though, that most people don't see what goes on on Twitter. Uh, Facebook status updates live for about 11 minutes. On average, that's by Facebook's own numbers. That's why they're starting to charge people to, to resurface their stuff. And most people don't scroll through their entire Twitter timeline. I hope that was. Next? Or one? I don't buy it, I promise. Hi. Um, so I work for a nonprofit here in Chicago, and a small one at that. Oh, and so cool. we actually got the human element. I feel like we have it down. But what's your advice on? Um, shops that are small and trying to do it, everything, not just nonprofits, but maybe mom and pop businesses, small organizations. I found, and I, I don't suspect it's true for you, but I found in working with not for profits, they're a terrible PR. Absolutely terrible PR. I uh, don't know how, which, which is amazing because when you think about it, a not for profit, except for you know, the big ones, which are all about making money, I'm not going to name names again. Uh, the small not for profits already have a story. You already know who you are and what you do and who you help and what you're going to do with the donations you get. And you're, I hope, more transparent than like the Comins of the world and all that. So it's all about for you not spending a lot of money and figuring out how to get good PR. Press and public relations is the easiest thing in the world. It's all about coming up with a good story. How do you come up with a good story? Watch Die Hard. Uh, I recommend also books by Robert McKee. It's $40, so see if you can buy it used. It's called Story. Uh, Save the Cat is also very good. I would take those books, get them used, and ask yourself, OK, how can I pitch my not-for-profit? How can I pitch my small shop in such a way that people are going to remember and that they're going to be interested in talking about it? That's what I would act on. So for example, there's something called the Hollywood shorthand. I always like to give this example. I love the Golden Girls. I don't know how many of you actually remember that show. Wonderful program about a bunch of elderly women who are kindly awaiting death. Uh, and then there's another show called Man Tracker. How many of you are familiar with Man Tracker? OK, I found like very few people know this show. Man Tracker is basically, I'm going to turn you loose in the Canadian woods, and I'm going to fucking find you. That's Man Tracker. Using the Hollywood shorthand is all about taking high-level visual concepts. How do you tell stories? How do you cre create content? Good content that people actually give a shit about. Visual, 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 visual. The Hollywood shorthand, if I was to pitch it to the press, I would go, my new program is Man Tracker meets the Golden Girls. You immediately know what that looks like. You automatically can picture this guy on a big horse chasing elderly women through the Canadian wilderness. That's how you have to think. You have to be able to craft stories in such a way that are memorable, using big visuals. You have to learn the elements of, of people like Robert McKee. You have to think like a Hollywood screenwriter. Books to buy, save the cat, 
very, very good. Uh, writing movies for fun and profit, also very, very good. That's the kind of thing that you have to think about. If you can do that, you will drive attention through press, which will bring in donations. Save the Cat and, Save the cat and How to Write Movies for Fun and Profit. Uh, you talk about being human <laughs> online. Um, it made me think of uh, like auto DMs is like one of the least human things you can possibly do. W what are some of the other anti-human things that uh, community managers should just stop doing right now? Don't mass broadcast, which sounds like blasphemy because like Twitter is designed for you to do mass broadcast. It'll be more time consuming but I've found that this works time and time again. Create a database of your followers on any given platform. It doesn't have to be Twitter. I'm just going to use it for this example. Start talking to them on any given day and find out something about them. Oh, hey, you like the Cubs? I like the Cubs too. Find a hook that ties the Cubs to what you do, bring it to him, and then go just go down the list. It's time consuming. I, I know it's a lot of work. But if you can start to do that, even if you do five a day, if you're still doing mass broadcasts because your boss wants you to, or you're still doing it because you feel like it works, like you said, everyone's going to be different. Five a day. Just pick five followers a day, get their phone number, get some information about them, talk to them. Don't push anything. But once you find something, once you find something and you're like, I think this will work really well for Dale, bring it to him. And if you have his phone number, call him. Call them. You will surprise the fuck out of people if you call them based on what you do on social media. That's the best way to do it. So what, you know, how do you do that? How do you incorporate that? Still do your mass broadcasts until you start building that database. And then slowly transition away and go, OK, this is being human. This is building a relationship in a legitimate, non-BS social media sort of way. And just do five a day, then do 10, then do 20. That's the thing that I recommend. You know, the whole thing with not being human, mass broadcasts, direct messages, hashtags. I'm not a fan of hashtags. They, for conferences, they work really well. I found that they generally don't work for much else because they could be hijacked. A great example of this is like, anytime is a bless you, anytime there's a big award ceremony, you always hear some shit about how they set a record for tweets. But what you don't realize is that if you actually go back and look like starting, go all the way back to Miss America, if you go back and look through all the tweets, You'll find there's a lot of people who have no idea what the actual hashtag has anything to do. They'll just be like, oh, hey, that looks like fun. I'm going to joke around. Trending topics are easy to game. If you can do about 40 tweets about something kind of similar, it'll start to surface in your area. If you can do maybe about 140, you'll start to see it surface even more. It's very easy to manipulate. That goes back to the algorithms that uh, this gentleman was asking about. That's not being human. So what I'm saying to all of you is pull people offline. It'll take work. It's going to take a lot of time, but it'll be worth it. I think we're, we're out of time. Sorry. Oh, one last thing, 518-832-9844, or bj at bjmendelson.com. If you do not get a book, I will send you a free electronic copy. It's 518-832-9844. Uh, so 518-832-9844, send me a text message with your email address. When the next day or so, I will send you a free electronic copy of the book. You can do whatever you want with it. You can pass it around. I don't really care. Thanks, everybody.